Sup y'all, it's me, it's your boy Mr. D, back at it again with a quick CI and sub points video. This is a lecture I give at the start of all my classes. Um, I update it every now and then, but really it's pretty much the same. Uh, I think this year we're going to save a bit of time and have you watch it at home because a lot of you are familiar with these ideas. Um, you probably want to take a look at the content on each screen, figure out if uh, you need to really listen to what I'm saying or whether it's just review. Uh, but ultimately, if this is new to you, I'll try to give you a quick lowdown on what I expect at the top level of argumentation. The thesis, which is composed of the controlling idea and the subpoints. So when it comes to the controlling idea, what you're really trying to prove in an essay, your thesis, there are three standards you must meet. They are your thesis must be argumentative, beyond the text, narrow and specific. If those are new terms, write them down. If they're not, you know, this is just review. And I'm going to go over each of these standards and what they each mean. Let's start with number one, which is to be argumentative. To be argumentative means that your controlling idea must be debatable. It cannot be a description of a fact. Uh, this means that in literature, what is factual are the events of the plot. Okay. Uh, so we're not going to be having plot summary as our overall argument. Of course, we can leverage the plot towards some other argument, but you cannot use plot summary as your sole goal for the paper, and you want to avoid statements of fact as well. So take a look at this problematic thesis in Steven Spielberg's Jaws, a giant shark terrorizes a nice beach community. Okay, that is not argumentative, it's a description of fact. It happens. A better thesis would be in Jaws, Steven Spielberg conveys that fear of the unknown can only be conquered through courage. Uh, what are the debatable aspects of this? Well, maybe uh, fear of the unknown cannot be conquered. Uh, maybe it can be conquered through alternate means. Um, these are not self-evident claims, but claims that would need uh, additional backing. So there are two types of acceptable argumentative claims in my class. Um, I highly suggest that you really focus on the first one, and if you want to get fancy, you can go to the second one. The first one is a value judgment, which is about as basic as things get. It's asserting something is good or bad, okay? The second type is a causal claim, which is asserting that one thing causes another. Now, just right off the bat, you should be immediately skeptical sometimes of things that sound like causal claim arguments, uh, but are not. Here's what I mean. Let's take a very descriptive fact that would fail the standard of being argumentative, like high pressure systems in the atmosphere create rain. Okay, that is a cause and effect relationship that's being described, is it not? But it's not really an argumentative claim that is appropriate for a literary paper because there's no other side to this causal claim. It's a scientific fact. Uh, the more basic example I probably should have started with is, right, if I were to drop a ball, gravity will cause the ball to fall. That is a cause and effect relationship, but not a cause and effect relationship that is somehow debatable, right? Gravity is a scientific theory. It's not up for debate. We can test it, but, you know, you're going to get the same result every time. So immediately you should be kind of careful because the causal claim could lead you to make a descriptive claim as opposed to an argumentative claim. Whereas when we go up here to the value judgment, if you are truly making a value judgment, if you are saying that something is good or bad, that is inherently argumentative. Okay. Science does not have descriptive facts like cake is good or cake is bad. It doesn't make those types of claims. So you can pretty much make sure you're avoiding descriptive claims by ensuring that you have a value judgment. Uh, one thing I want to talk about here for the causal claim scope, what I mean by scope is, well, okay, Mr. D, I know that my essay is supposed to have nine concrete details that I'm supposed to do commentary on. Does that mean I need to prove the cause and the effect in each of my CDs? No, that'd be really hard, right? Finding nine passages which each talk about both a cause and an effect, that'd be a very unreasonable evidence standard. So when you're doing a causal claim, I expect you to prove the cause leads to the effect over the course of each body paragraph, okay? So that means that we're in a happy medium. On, on one end of the spectrum, there's what we talked about you not having to do, which is demonstrate cause and effect in each concrete detail. Okay, don't have to do that. Then we can go to the complete other side of the spectrum. And I might say, well, paragraph one can establish the cause, paragraph two can establish the cause, and then you only have to show the effect in paragraph three. That's not good enough to me either. 
we're going to start in the middle and we're going to say each body paragraph needs to demonstrate the cause and eventually demonstrate the effect, okay? So keep that in mind when you're thinking about what types of evidence you need for a causal claim. Another thing to keep in mind here is the classic PHEPH. -E of course, we all know what that means. No, I'm kidding. No one knows what that means. Uh, it's an abbreviation for post hoc ergo propter hoc, which is a logical fallacy or a logical mistake that a lot of my students make when they write causal claim essays. And it's something I want you to avoid. Okay, what does that mean, post hoc ergo propter hoc? Uh, that is Latin for the phrase after, therefore, because of. Okay, uh, the way that we describe this way of thinking in English is correlation does not imply causation. Okay, just because something comes after another thing does not mean the prior thing causes the secondary thing, right? We can think of infinite absurd examples that would come up if we truly believe this. For example, let's say the sun comes up in the morning and then later I use the restroom. If I was falling prey to this fallacy, I would say, well, the sun came up, therefore Mr. D had to go use the restroom, right? Just because something follows another thing does not imply that it is caused by that thing. So what is the implication if you're trying to make a causal claim? Uh, well, you need to have good reasoning as to why there is a connection between the cause and the effect. Now, you don't need direct evidence from the text saying, quote, therefore, this thing causes the other thing, right? That's just not going to be there. This is really a test of reasonable logic as to, okay, can I see the connection between these two things? Or did you just find something that happened in chapter 14, find something that happened in chapter 15, and therefore assert that they happened because of each other. That's actually, I would say, less rare. The whole like plot order thing that I just described is actually less rare than students saying, well, this book is generally about this idea. Let's say a book is generally about greed, okay? And then there's a character who does something bad. And oftentimes they will take the shortcut of saying, well, clearly this character does this thing out of greed because this book is about greed right? Which is not the type of rigor we need when it comes to causal claims. So those are some things to keep in mind when it comes to moving to this kind of, I would say, a little bit more advanced or higher standard of argumentation. Now, you can also do what I call the combo meal, which is to have a value judgment and a causal claim, right? Now, oftentimes that happens once you get to the sub points. Your sub points are reasons that support your controlling idea, and perhaps something is good because it causes something, right? I can give you an example off the top of my head, right? If I'm going to say exercise is good, maybe the reason it's good is because it causes one to become healthy, right? So now we're talking about a value judgment and a causal claim kind of working together. So that's totally kosher. So I'm going to put these examples on the screen, pause the video, um, evaluate them yourself, and when you're done, unpause, and I'll let you know what the answers were. Okay, hopefully you've evaluated these for yourself. Number one is a trick. Number one is a descriptive claim. It's not a causal claim or a value judgment, all right? Um, pizza is a food many ingredients. That's not debatable. Eating pizza leads to immense happiness. That is a uh, causal claim. You could say it's an implicit value judgment as well. Uh, what I mean by implicit is even though it's not directly stated, it's pretty easy to imply. Um, <clears throat> not many people are going to argue that immense happiness is bad. So it's kind of a causal claim and a value judgment. Pizza is one of the worst foods known to humanity. That's a clear value judgment. Totalitarianism is the most dangerous form of government. Value judgment. Avoiding hardship prevents one from growing. Causal claim with a, probably an implicit value judgment. And one should do their homework value judgment. So standard two we need to discuss is beyond the text. This is a standard that used to be very difficult for students to understand, uh, but because it is more and more being used in the Bellarmine English Department, it has become easier to understand, I would say. Um, what does it mean? It's a very awkward phrase beyond the text. It's just, there's no great phrase for this, but the real meaning of beyond the text is that your claim must be abstracted beyond the characters and plot so that you are arguing about a higher idea or concept, right? Let me show you two examples and it'll become very clear what I mean here, right? 
The type of thesis that you will not write for my class is the film Infinity War conveys the dangers of characters like Thanos who use Infinity Stones to murder people in the name of achieving balance in the universe. Okay, what is this an argument about? Ultimately, your answer should be, it's an argument about a character. Thanos is bad. Okay, now let's go back to standard one, being argumentative. Is this argumentative? Yes, it's saying Thanos is bad. But here's what it's not doing. Go back to the definition of beyond the text. It is not making an argument about an idea or concept. It's making an idea about a character. So what we need to do is we need to figure out, okay, what ideas or concepts were the writers of Infinity War trying to explore through the character of Thanos? We need to go one layer deeper, okay? Or one level up, depending on which metaphor you prefer. Let's rewrite that thesis, and now we've got the film Infinity War conveys the dangers of treating individuals as means to an end in the name of achieving a larger goal. Okay? Really, your examples and evidence for both of these theses are going to be the same. You're going to be talking about Thanos. You're going to be talking about the things he does to achieve his goals. But one of them is making sure that argument is abstract, and one of them is not. So we prefer the latter one. Okay, let's see this idea play out again. Another problematic thesis would be in Herman Melville's Moby Dick, Captain Ahab's obsession with Moby Dick leads to his own destruction. Let's ask a quick question. Is that argumentative? Pause the video, figure it out for yourself. Okay, yes, this is argumentative. It's a causal claim about what causes Ahab's destruction. Maybe it was his, I don't know, congenital heart failure. Maybe it was his uh, lack of prayer. Maybe it was his failure to take English to honors. I don't know. We can debate why Ahab ultimately meets his destruction. Of course, we couldn't debate something like he is destroyed. That's a fact. But why he is destroyed is something we could debate. But the problem here is, what is this an argument about? It's once again an argument about the character, Captain Ahab. It's not abstracted. So let's fix that. It actually becomes simpler when we abstract it. It actually becomes easier. In Moby Dick, obsession leads to destruction. Boom. Clear causal claim between two ideas. Easier. So pause the video for a second and see if this CI is beyond the text. Okay, this is a tough example because you may not know Raskolnikov is the name of a character, but some of my students can figure out just by the way the sentence is written that he is a character, and ultimately this CI is not beyond the text, given that this is an argument about why a character descends into madness. Same thing here. Pause the video, see if you can figure it out. And yes, this is beyond the text because this is an argument about two ideas embracing the mysterious nature of reality and enlightenment and a causal claim between them. Okay, standard three we're gonna go over is being narrow and specific. Okay, ironically, this is the vaguest standard, <laughs> which is funny because it's called narrow and specific. But really what I mean by being narrow and specific is you have to ask yourself, am I required to ask a follow-up question to understand the literal meaning of this controlling idea? Here's what I mean. Sometimes students will turn in theses like this. In the film, Star Wars, A New Hope, George Lucas argues what it takes for one to become a hero. What question am I required to ask as a follow-up? I'm required to ask, what does it take for one to become a hero? Does it take exceptionally strong thighs? Does it take a generosity of spirit? Does it take uh, the ability to eat 42 strawberries in one sitting? I don't know. It's not narrow and specific yet. Okay. So we can fix that at the bottom here by saying in the film Star Wars A New Hope, George Lucas argues that one should become a hero by listening to one's conscience. Okay, so I've got a value judgment in there with the should, and I've got specificity about how that happens, listening to one's conscience. Okay, take a look at these examples and test them each by yourself. Pause the video. Are they narrow and specific? Okay, hopefully you've taken a look at those yourself. Number one is not specific. What does happen in a society of surveillance and totalitarianism? Is there exceptionally good public transit? Uh, is there clean water? Is there tyranny? I don't know. It's not being described. Second one, also, of course, 
not narrow and specific, what question do I need to ask as a follow-up? What are the steps to be successful? And of course, according to Pokemon, the steps are to catch animals against their will, force them to battle to the death, and use them for your personal success. And finally, the example there at the bottom of the screen is narrow and specific. It clearly uh, it articulates what is happening in the thesis. So let's talk about subpoints. Okay, so we are now transitioning to the second part of uh, the thesis. We've moved away from controlling idea standards. We're now going to talk about the subpoint. Take a look at this um, flow chart up here. I find it a very helpful visual to understand the role of subpoints. The role of subpoints is simply to divide your controlling idea into three. And of course, that's really helpful because you're going to have three body paragraphs. So think of your subpoints as the kind of uh, subheader for a body paragraph. Uh, subpoints in my class must be beyond the text just like your controlling idea okay so immediately if you really think about what that means a thesis like let's say you're writing on i don't know what's a book that most people know fahrenheit 451 you get a controlling idea and the controlling idea is something like i don't know ray bradbury condemns us you know repression and ignorance or affirms the significance of learning if your subpoints must be beyond the text, you know that you cannot follow that thesis with something like, as seen through Guy, Clarice, and Mrs. Bowles. Because of course, those are three characters, not three ideas, okay? What really traps some of my students and gets them in trouble is the insistence they have that they will connect their CI and their subpoints using the phrase, as seen through. Okay, as seen through will set you up for failure. It's time to upgrade your connector. You need to connect your CI to your subpoints using because. That will set you up to have reasons why the CI is true that develop the reasoning of your paper. Okay, when you use as seen through, you often do not give the reader any indication of what your reasoning is going to be. That's kind of problematic. It makes it hard for me as a teacher to judge whether you're on the right track when you turn in a thesis, because I don't even know what you're really gonna say. Whereas if you avoid that, I do know what you're gonna say and I can help you develop those thoughts. So take a look at these two examples. On the left here, you have a thesis which does not follow my advice and it uses as seen through. In Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, Bronte affirms the importance of self-reliance, okay, nice value judgment in the CI, as seen through judgment, skills, and partners. Does that give you any idea what you're going to read about? Not really, not in any clear way. Take a look at how much more thought you can see in the second example. In Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, Bronte affirms the importance of self-reliance because self-reliance frees one from judgment develops one's skills and talents, and makes one a desirable partner. I want you to notice, these two writers may have the exact same evidence, the exact same reasoning, and the exact same subpoints. Take a look. Judgment, judgment, skills, skills, partners, partners. But here, because of the because connector, I know what each of these things has to do with self-reliance. Oh, self-reliance frees one from judgment. Okay. So it's not like it increases judgment or it, uh, I don't know, eliminates all judgment, but it frees one from it. Okay. Same thing with skills. Over here, I don't know what self-reliance does to skills. Does it increase skills, decrease skills, increase ice skating ability? I don't know. Here we know, oh, it develops one's skills. Good. And partners, does it make one, are your partners bad? Are they good? Oh, it makes you a more desirable partner. Long story short, your sub points should indicate a line of reasoning. They should tell me a reason why the CI is true. Each one. Okay, and you'll have three reasons. So, same information as the last slide up here. Take a look at two new examples. On the left, in Herman Melville's Moby Dick, Melville criticizes obsession as seen through morals, relationships, and judgment. Compare that to the right, in Herman Melville's Moby Dick, Melville criticizes obsession because obsession corrupts one's morals, destroys one's relationships, and clouds one's judgment.
okay? A lot clearer here on the right. So those are two great examples. If you want to go back in the video, you can see the slides. Two great examples of how to develop your subpoints appropriately, okay? So you can take a look at this slide, but this is really just an example of another thesis that meets those standards. Um, things to notice about this thesis that meets the standards I've set out. Um, it starts with in author's title, author argues. Um, that's just a good format for you to start your thesis with. Some people try to get a little bit fancier, do something else. It's unnecessary. Just start with in author's blank, author argues. That's a fine formula. Note that the novel play or collection of multiple poems is in italics. There's a causal claim, modern life leads to discontent. Of course, there's an implicit value judgment in there. Discontent is not good, okay? Uh, the subpoints are beyond the text, separating one from nature, obsessing one with material goods, and destroying one's morality. Uh, that is not in the text, like example of the dog, Phoebe, and Jeff. We use one to keep things beyond the text. You don't have to use one, you can use people, or if, if, you're, if your thesis is kind of more specific, uh, than just people, feel free to use a different noun, but one is also a great way to keep things beyond the text. And the subpoints are grammatically parallel. This is a standard I haven't talked about yet, but notice how all three of them are verbs uh, conjugated in the same tense by separating, obsessing, destroying. So all verbs, all in the progressive tense. Okay. Let's take a look at this example. You can pause the video and evaluate this thesis for yourself. What is it doing well? What is it doing poorly? Okay, hopefully you've evaluated this thesis for yourself. You should notice that there are no italics for the novel A Christmas Carol. <gasps> who, could, who could do such a thing? Uh, the controlling value, the controlling idea is a value judgment. One should be kind to others. Yes, it's kind of obvious. Some of my students are like, oh, this is a bad thesis. It's too obvious. Look, I'm not asking you to be incredibly insightful. I'm asking you to make an argument. All right, you'll be insightful in how you use evidence and how you argue about that evidence at the level of the controlling idea. It's okay to sometimes be a bit, bit obvious. The subpoints are not beyond the text here because it helps Scrooge and good effects for Tiny Tim. Notice how we have characters mentioned there. That's a big flashing neon sign that this is not beyond the text. The subpoints are not grammatically parallel because it helps Scrooge helps others. Okay, we've got two verbs in the present tense and good effects. And now we've got a noun, sad face. Okay, so let's clean it up. In Charles Dickens' novel, A Christmas Carol, Dickens, argue that one should, Dickens argues that one should be kind to others because it helps one find gratitude, improves the lives of others, and allows one to forgive others. Great. Feels amazing, man. Hopefully that has been a pretty quick Reminder about controlling idea and subpoint standards. Some of this stuff is definitely new for you if you are a uh, incoming sophomore. If you're an incoming junior, a lot of this stuff is review. Um, and if you're an incoming sophomore, some of this stuff might be review. But hopefully, the fact that this is recorded means that you can come back to this when you're writing an essay um, to refresh your mind, look at some of these examples. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching.